the NSA access to its fiber optic internet cables. We were told one day in late 2002 that an NSA representative was coming to the office to speak to a certain management technician about a special job. And this turned out to be installing a secret room in the next office I was going to be in the following year. And that secret room involved a lot of spying equipment. Only this one management technician could go in there, and the regular union technicians were not allowed to go in there. But uh, when in 2003, I was assigned to that office, and I got hold of the documents, which were available, they're not classified, and the documents showed what they were doing. They were basically copying the entire data stream going across critical internet cables and copying the entire data stream to this secret room. So the NSA was getting everything. That's Mark Klein, the former AT&T technician who blew the whistle on the involvement of phone companies in the Bush administration's domestic surveillance program. Uh, Jim Bamford with us for the hour, author of The Shadow Factory, out today. Um, can you talk about uh, how the CIA or the NSA um, is now working out secret and potentially illegal agreements with the telecom industry in order to access U.S. telecommunications and what exactly Mark Klein is talking about, not just potentially illegal, what they've done. Sure. And uh, just before I do that, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, these people for speaking out. It's uh, having been writing on this topic for 25 years, I know how difficult it is for anybody to to come out and speak about what's going on at NSA. It's a very difficult thing. So Mark Klein and Adrian Kinney and David Murphy Falk, uh, Mark Rossini, these people, uh, 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 you know, I look at as heroes because they've come out and and, and pointed a finger uh, at what's been going wrong without, uh, you know, there's no compensation. They're they're risking their uh, the rest of their career, possibly risking uh, the uh, the U.S. government by coming out and pointing these fingers. So, uh, you know, I just have a lot of admiration for these people. And what Mark Klein uh, was talking about, uh, he was a supervisor for 22 years over at uh, AT&T, and he discovered this secret room in this uh, facility in San Francisco, this very tall 10, 12-story building out in San Francisco, which is basically the switch, AT&T's... Uh, switch for their communications in that part of the uh, country, the, the sort of uh, uh, western part of the country. And um, what happened is that uh, during the 1990s and early uh, in the 80s and the 70s, the NSA used to collect information by putting out big dishes and collecting satellite communications that would come down. It was very easy. They put the dishes out. Satellite uh, transmits the telephone calls and messages, emails, and so forth down to Earth, and the satellite picks it up, and then NSA collects it. NSA didn't have to deal with the telecommunication companies at all because they could get the information independent of the telecom companies. Then in the late 90s, things began to change, and fiber optics became a big, uh, a big thing for telecommunications. Fiber optics are cables in which the uh, communications are transmitted, not electronically, but by uh, uh, photons, uh, uh, light signals. And that made life very difficult for NSA. It meant the communications, instead of being able to pick them up in a big dish, uh, they were now being transmitted under the ocean in these, uh, these cables. And the only way to get access to it would be to put a submarine down and try to tap into those cables. But that, uh, from the people I've talked to, has not been uh, uh, very successful with uh, fiber optic cables. Uh, so the only other way to really do this is by making uh, some kind of an agreement with the telecom company so that NSA could actually uh, basically cohabitate some of the uh, telecom companies' locations. And that's what happened. NSA began making these agreements with AT&T and other companies, and that in order to get access to the actual cables, they had to build these secret rooms in these uh, buildings. So what would happen would be the communications on the cables would come into the building, and then the cable would go to this thing called a splitter box, which was a box that had uh, uh, something that was similar to a prism, a glass prism. 
and uh, the prism was shaped uh, uh, like a prism, and the light signals would come in, and they'd be split by the prism. And uh, one copy of, uh, of the light signal would go off to where it was supposed to be going uh, in the telecom system, and the other half, this new cloned copy of the cables, would actually go one floor below to NSA's secret room. So you have one copy of everything coming in and going to NSA's secret room. And in the secret room was equipment by uh, a private company called NARAS, the very small company hardly anybody's ever heard of uh, that uh, created the hardware and the software to analyze these uh, cables and then pick out the uh, targets NSA is looking for and then forward the, the targeted communications. Oh on to NSA headquarters. So you have these companies, uh, AT&T and Verizon, that are secretly working with the NSA and tapping um, uh, Americans' phone lines. And these companies actually outsource the actual tapping to some little-known foreign companies? Yeah, there's uh, uh, two major—or not major, they're, they're small companies, but they're, they're, uh, they service the two major telecom companies. Uh, this company, Naris, which uh, was founded in Israel and uh, has large uh, Israel um, uh, connections, um, does the uh, basically the tapping of the communications on AT&T. Um, and Verizon chose another company, ironically also founded in Israel and, and uh, largely controlled by uh, uh, and developed by uh, people in Israel. Um, uh, called Verant. Uh, so these two companies specialize in what's known as mass surveillance. Their literature, I read uh, this literature from Verant, for example, uh, that's supposed to only go to intelligence agencies and so forth, and it, uh, it says uh, uh, we specialize in mass surveillance, and that's what they do. They put these mass surveillance uh, equipment uh, in these facilities. So you have AT&T, for example, um, that you know, considers it's their job to get messages from one person to another, not tapping into uh, messages. And you get the NSA that says, we want, you know, copies of all this. So that's where these companies come in. These companies act as the yeah. intermediary, basically, between the telecom companies and the, uh, the NSA. Now, Jim Venford, take this a step further, because you say the founder and former CEO of one of these companies is now a fugitive from the United States somewhere in Africa? Well, I run, you know, this is a this is a company that the uh, uh, U.S. government uh, uh, is getting all its tapped information from. It's a company that Verizon uh, uh, uses as its uh, tapping uh, company. It's an eavesdropping company, and uh, very little is known about these companies. The Congress has never looked into any of this. Uh, I don't know. I don't think they even know that there is a, that these companies exist. Um, but the company that uh, Verizon uses, Verant, uh, the founder of the company, the former uh, head of the company, uh, is now a fugitive in uh, uh, hiding out in Africa, uh, in the country of Namibia, um, uh, because he's wanted on a number of felony warrants for fraud and, and other uh, charges. And then two other top executives of the company, uh, the general counsel and another top official. Um, of the parent company uh, uh, have also pled guilty to uh, to these charges. So, you know, you've got uh, com these companies have foreign connections with potential ties uh, to foreign intelligence agencies, and uh, you have problems of credibility, problems.